So let's start and then we will take him in whenever. So I want to welcome you to uh, Ruffin Weidwagner's final defense. The procedure is sort of we will ask um, we will ask Ruffin to do a 45 minute like presentation. Uh, then we'll have sort of a Q&A with the audience and with the committee. Then we'll have a private uh, discussion with Ruffin, just a committee and, and Ruffin. And then uh, finally, the committee will have a private deliberation. Uh, the committee is, I'm Henry Christensen. I'm the chair of the committee uh, from CSE. Tiana Rosing is also from Computer Science and Engineering. Then we have Stefan Savage. Then we have Dean Stefan. And we have uh, Tom Beavley, who's currently missing in action. Uh, so it's the five of us that are doing this. And then um, we, should, uh, we should all, this is a celebration of uh, research. So Ruffin, I'm handing it over to you and uh, it's your turn. All right. Anyone hear me clearly? So um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Um, I know it's a shame that we had to do this remotely but uh, on the on the other side of things, um, I think it's it's excellent that uh, a lot of my family and relatives and uh, friends from across the continent, across the globe, have um, had the chance to attend this. So um, thank you guys for either getting up early or staying up late to to attend. Uh, thanks for my committee for making time to uh, be here. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to present. Uh, my work on my dissertation, usable, usable security and verification for distributed robotic systems. So this will be the outline of today's talk. Um, so I'll just dive right into the introduction here. So uh, BCUSD or before USD, uh, I was at Georgia Tech where I got started in my uh, graduate uh, career and the robotics program there. Uh, with the Institute of Robotics and Intelligent Machines, where I met my advisor, Henrik, uh, along with the other uh, numerous uh, notable um, graduate alums and researchers. Um, and so while I was there, I was primarily interested in mobile robotics, um, seeing that as, as a means of assistive technology. And so in particularly, I was interested in SLAM research, simultaneous localization and mapping, object tracking, uh, all that stuff. Um, and that's what got me into using ROS. Uh, what is ROS? So ROS stands for Robotic Operating System, but it's not an operating system per se uh, in the traditional sense. It's more of like a federated community of robotic software libraries and standards, developer toolings, and it's often, it's often um, described in like four major components, your plumbing, your tools, your capabilities, and your ecosystem. So the plumbing, uh, provides a publish subscribe message infrastructure designed to support quick and easy construction of distributed com uh, computation systems. So uh, providing standard message types, uh, conventions uh, to allow easy interoperability between uh, uh, decoupled, uh, loosely coupled robotic systems that's common in uh, robotic architectures. The second thing is it provides a tooling uh, not only like your build tools and your packaging for your software development, but also uh, simulation-based environments for uh, real-world 3D um, perception and physics, um, your uh, automated calibration, your debug visualizations. Um, so that's, it's usually essential for when we're developing for robotics applications. Uh, lastly, ROS provides a broad collection of libraries to implement useful robot functionality. Um, the focus on, say, mobility, manipulation, or perception. Um, so that's from uh, your SLAM libraries to your collision checking to your kinematic constraint solvers, uh, all that good stuff. And lastly, uh, ROS provides a uh, free and open source software uh, community. So it's, it's a growing uh, group of uh, developers and collaborators from across the globe uh, as well as uh, international conferences for both training and disseminating robotic software uh, development. And so primarily, the, like in the early days, uh, this community consists most of academics, but uh, industry uh, partners and uh, developers have been a, a growing number of, of participants. 
But as you can see, the uh, seminal work in Ross uh, with the uh, paper cited here with over 8,400 citations. So the author of that work, uh, Morgan Quigley, um, was one of the uh, first uh, developers in Ross while he was at the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, uh, the Computer Science Department at Stanford. Um, and so one of the issues that they were tackling back then is sort of this, this uh, prevailing trope in robotics research of, of like reinventing the wheel. Um, so let's take the case of like this uh, epic paper, state-of-the-art paper comes out. Um, you are tasked to either review or extend this work. You find out it's like this garbage research code and you set out with the noble goal to like, I'm going to implement this uh, from the ground up with a better implementation. You eventually, you know, run out of time, you need to graduate, you publish. And so the cycle kind of perpetuates because it's just like one individual. Um, and so this kind of to, touches into the, the motivation of, of the work today. Um, so early on, uh, um, as I was doing uh, robotics uh, research development, this, this got me into like the realities of, of, of development. So one thing I like to point to is the, the matrix of hell that you might be familiar with uh, in the IT field. And, and robotics is, it exasperates this where we have the multi-dimensional nature of hell. So not only do we have different operating systems, software libraries, but we'll have different drivers and different peripherals and different robotic platforms to take into account as well as all the various domains that we have in the multidisciplinary field of robotics. Um, and so uh, one way is that this affects the robotics research uh, and, and, and significantly impairs the, the scientific progress is that of repeatability and reproducibility. Um, so if, if, if you're a robotics researcher or a graduate student, you might be familiar with this paradigm that you're working on like some collecting some data set and one of your colleagues pumps over your shoulder and it's like, hey, uh, I got a tool that kind of does that already for you. You don't have to re-implement it. So you're like, okay, uh, I'll use your work. And you find out, you know, it's not working. Um, everything's broken. Uh, nothing's documented. And I can't reproduce your build environment. So I end up wasting a lot of time and getting nowhere. And so this has uh, made its own, uh, this became its own like edition in the robotics automation magazine. Uh, one particular quote that kind of resonates with me is uh, showed that not a single paper among the top cited ones in SLAM and navigation met all the basic criteria listed for GEM guidelines. That's good experimental methodology. Um, so uh, my getting involved, uh, how I got involved with, with uh, Ross development, my, my first endeavor was um, uh, adapting the technologies that have been common and popular in web development. So that is the use of Linux containers to uh, compartmentalize and make um, not only your, your code um, portable, but also reproducible and something you could archive. So if you're digging up a paper way in, in later in the years, uh, you'll have the exact binaries and runtimes that you can use to, to reproduce the, the results of particular publications. But it's also advantageous for like continuous development. Um, so that got me thinking, you know, what are the other big barriers um, in robotics development? So um, at, over the course of when I was working on the SLAM research, I get to the point where, hey, I need to, you know, uh, exchange uh, my SLAM algorithms with these companies that are sponsoring our work like Boeing. And, you know, they're just, you know, pure industry engineers. And we'd have like very little commonality in like the software ecosystems that we're working with. So I basically have to like teach them ROS from scratch. Um, and so that gets into the, like this big disconnect between robotics research and industry where, you know, industry doesn't have the benefit of like all the algorithms that we're coming out with, uh, while research doesn't have like the benefit of all the hardware peripherals and uh, interfaces that are coming out for um, the robotics industry. So, you know, there's been plenty of initiatives uh, to tackle that in specific domains, uh, such as the medical space, industrial manufacturing, uh, hardware uh, peripherals. And so uh, what, what, I was, what I saw particularly egregious in terms of a, a barrier in technical transfer was that in security. And so um, it, what's unique about uh, autonomous robotic systems is, is they're sort of like an, an extension of the spectrum of uh, mobility and exposure. You, you had, you know, robotics is sort of like, you know, where the personal uh, computing devices were, you know, two or uh, uh, one or two decades ago where you suddenly had this explosion of computation that was suddenly interconnected and uh, wirelessly uh, interlinked. 
Um, and so with, with robotics, you know, we then have these compute, computing platforms that are working in autonomous uh, and unsupervised environments. And that, that, that brings different uh, security, uh, security considerations because these systems might provide, you know, unprecedented physical access that um, your common previous infrastructure uh, didn't experience. Uh, and so another thing is um, uh, security constitutes like, you know, these, these contributes these uh, uh, aspects such as you know, privacy, availability, integrity uh, for these cyber physical systems that uh, further the practicality and commercial value of these, of these infrastructures. Um, but the shortcomings of the existing robotics framework such as ROS um, remained a limiting factor in industry adoption um, given the real world requirements and risks. Uh, additionally, the, uh, if you were if you were to implement securities in these frameworks, you want to be considered uh, you want to be con uh, consider the usability uh, such that you know if 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 it's not accessible or it's it's easily usable, these multidisciplinary roboticists uh, they aren't going to necessarily adopt it and they're not going to see a return on investment on like you know why why implement all of this uh, this hassle. So this touches uh, gets to my thesis statement. And so I'm just gonna read it aloud here. To protect real world distributed robotic systems from cyber physical threats, and to ensure security is considered throughout the robotic software development lifecycle, it is necessary to design tools to configure, verify, and monitor secure information flow control for robotic application middleware. Usability will be key for the broader adoption and viability of cybersecurity across a range of robotic applications. And so what I've just discussed sort of touches on the first section of my thesis statement. Um, and let's get on to uh, how do I attempt to, to, to prove that. So I'm going to take three main approaches. So first is to identify the typical threat models and attack vectors for robotic middleware. Then uh, develop a sort of accessible tooling to enable and verify security in robotics, as well as to monitor using like immutable logging frameworks. And then thirdly is the sort of a summarization of the design principles to improve security on how usability ties into uh, the importance of all this. So uh, first contribution involves SROS, but uh, slightly, you know, uh, before that, uh, I worked with uh, uh, some other robotics uh, security researchers on penetrating testing tools for ROS. So uh, there's been a lot of prior work on, you know, uh, 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 claiming, you know, these hypothetical attacks that you can employ on ROS uh, because it's uh, either a clear text protocol or um, it's using um, these readily accessible APIs. Uh, but we wanted to develop and demonstrate uh, these attacks using um, uh, penetration testing tools that we released, both uh, ROS Pen2 and ROS Chaos. And so uh, one is to document sort of all the uh, flaws in the ROS1 API. Um, and then you, you can provide, you can then uh, achieve various attacks such as a uh, stealth publisher, uh, man in the middle, service isolation, uh, malicious, malicious uh, parameter update. And so on the right here, I'm just going to kind of walk through one particular attack for service isolation, where you may have an attacker that contacts the, the ROS master, which serves as the discovery node for um, negotiating traffic all throughout the network. Um, and so what the, the attacker can do is essentially unregister a service uh, from the graph interface and sub subsequently gain exclusive access. Uh, and if subsequent clients come online, um, they will be, you know, completely isolated from this essential service. This could be like an e-stop feature or um, something more uh, benign. Uh, so that's where my, uh, my, one of my first contributions with uh, SROS. Um, so to um, essentially develop um, as an effort to support modern cryptography and security measures in ROS, um, you provide authenticated encryption and access control uh, within the uh, graph library APIs. Um, but uh, it, it essentially differs from previous approaches in that you know, usability was the focus in that I tried to retain as much of the ABI and API compliance as I could so that users wouldn't have to rewrite their application code or have to compile their project against out of mainline or unmaintained research branches uh, of ROS. Um, but it did come have some limiting factors. So even though it provided all these neat tools like um, 
uh, policy profile generation, runtime measurements, so that you can easily audit and compose your, your access control rules uh, through runtime demonstration. Uh, it was limited in that um, it was particular to one uh, client library with Python. Uh, and if we wanted to extend this uh, to other client libraries, we'd have to re-implement it for every language. Um, also, the use of, of TLS to encrypt the network traffic, you know, that relies on TCP, that relies on, uh, that's a reliable only transport. And so in the, in the space of robotics, we're dealing with wireless networks and, and, and lossy connectivity um, and embedded devices that we have more exotic QoS requirements. Um, and so this uh, reliable only transport uh, was not a, a one size fits all solution. Uh, at the same time, uh, the community was uh, migrating to uh, ROS2 or, or developing the frameworks to, to redesign and address the issues with ROS1. Uh, for security, the two kind of uh, um, not noteworthy aspects were there was a single shared API implementation. And that meant that if we were to implement security features, we would only have to implement that in the core C client library, and that would could you know, extend to all the various uh, languages that you'd bind against to. Uh, and secondly, sort of externalize the middleware specification. So in ROS1, uh, we were using sort of this homegrown transport protocol and serialization. Uh, so with the use of uh, more uh, industrial IoT middlewares, that gives us the benefit of where we can reuse external crypto libraries and uh, best practices and standard protocols. Um, and so that's what we did with uh, SROS2 is essentially kind of mainlining all these features that we had in ROS1 uh, into the ROS2 project. Now people could like apt install these, these tools to, to enable security for the ROS applications, you know, generate the security key material, um, define the policy permissions, uh, all that stuff. And so that's uh, the work I did with uh, also defining the design reps uh, for these. Um, and I talked about DDS. What, what does DDS stand for? It uh, stands for Data Distribution Service. It's a data-centric communication model. Um, so it's it's peer-to-peer -peer, uh, decentralized transport, um, and it's it's a standardized protocol. It's defined by the object management group. So there's many different vendors uh, that you can with different licensing models that you can you can use, um, but also provides uh, a host of parameterized uh, quality of service options that applicable for like aerospace, uh, medical, uh, industrial, manufacturing, um, and energy grids. And so what we're particularly taking advantage of is the, the standard defined for the DDS security spec. Um, and next we get to security tooling. So I tell you about D secure DDS and uh, how we're using that, but none of the particular vendors provide any tooling to automate or generate the key material or the security artifacts that you need to actually implement this. So aside from reading, you know, uh, 1000 pages of specification, how can we make this more accessible with, uh, with tooling? And so this is the work I get into with uh, procedural access control um, and particularly trying to automate the, the generation of, of all the security artifacts you'd need for uh, implementing a secure runtime. Um, and in particular, what we're focused on is trying to remove as, remove as much of the human factor in the automation to reduce uh, errors or provide same defaults to uh, prevent users from shooting themselves in the foot. Um, another benefit, though, is uh, when we went to, you know, uh, verify uh, and test our, our abstraction, you know, this, 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 this compilation from ROS abstractions to DDS implementations, uh, we were able to identify both uh, false negatives and uh, false positives. And so uh, using the uh, being able to trace these erroneous access control events or um, where principle of least privilege was not maintained in, in this abstraction helped us to identify bugs and issues both in the DDS uh, vendors as well as the ROS, uh, fundamental flaws in the uh, ROS2 mapping implementation. Um, another thing we worked on is uh, composable policy profiles. So as these systems get larger and larger, um, you want a way to uh, modular. So, so we're providing a markup to uh, facilitate the importing modularization of larger complex policies, uh, enabling sort of an abstraction of common profiles and primitives for ROS nodes, uh, while users can reuse the policy files. So you only have to like audit a particular component once, 
uh, and then you can reuse and compose that later in your subsystem. So here's an example of where we have a node that has particular rules and particular permissions associated with that rules and being able to import those uh, externally from other packages. The uh, last thing is uh, uh, working on sort of a formalification of the setup. So uh, one particular issue with the uh, procedural methods that we're doing is we were using sort of these brute force methods to test all the common net, uh, combinatorial combinations to find uh, discrepancies in the, in the uh, implementations. And as these uh, ROS systems get larger and larger, that, that's no longer you know, viable. So we went to you know, trying to supply like you know, stat solver logic where we can uh, use these formal methods to evaluate. But to motivate this work, um, we want to to flip this on its head where we're not just a policy author trying to validate our own configuration setup. Maybe we're an attacker and we're trying to do vulnerability excavation to find out uh, particular flaws in the existing implementation. So like there may be two scenarios where uh, you are an external observer and you're trying to ascertain the functionality and affordances of an unknown uh, black box device. Uh, or uh, you might have a well-known and locally understood uh, hardware peripheral and you're trying to discover how does that interconnect with a remote infrastructure. Uh, and so this is taking advantage of a particular issue um, in DDS and trying to raise awareness in that um, uh, with the security handshake protocol. And so in secure DDS, you need some way of establishing a secure uh, connection. So you have this classic handshake and in the handshake, you know, you have your uh, identity certificate and then, but you also have the permissions token. So it's a signed document that encodes all the access that you have. Um, and what we can do is we can easily capture that, you know, over Wireshark and aggregate um, these tokens. Um, and what these tokens kind of look like is, you know, it's this large XML document that has uh, a plethora of logic and like how two particular access tokens may connect to each other. Um, and so if we implement this, uh, um, the DDS security access control spec uh, in formal logic, you know, we can start reasoning about the potential connectivity of these systems. So here we have an example of these two matching topics because of, the, the, of how the glob string is used in this particular rule. And what's that gets you is um, uh, if you're able to aggregate these tokens, you can start reasoning about the top underlying topology of these computation graphs, even though the, the data samples that are being sent over the network are, are subsequently encrypted. Um, and what you can then also do uh, is not only, you can also infer maybe um, covert channels or um, lapses in the access control policy that provide you uh, different methods, different degrees of observability or controllability over the subsystem. So if you were an attacker and you were trying to compromise a, a particular uh, robotic subsystem, you might want to prioritize which particular element you're willing to invest and in to, to take over and what affordances that would grant you. Uh, say an autonomous vehicle example, you'll have like a drive-by wire and a multimedia system. If you were to take over the multimedia system, uh, would that afford you any means of, of controllability of the topics in the drive-by wire? So uh, lastly, I'd like to uh, touch on the uh, immutable logging frameworks. Uh, that, that we developed. So you may be familiar with uh, event data recorders, uh, EDRs, uh, also maybe known as a uh, black box uh, flight recorders used in aerospace. And so they're useful for an assortment of, of range of applications such as data set acquisition, modeling, uh, debugging, uh, auditing and verification, but also for like stuff for digital forensics investigations where you're trying to piece together uh, the outcomes or the, 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 the um, inputs of a particular event that resulted in, in serious out in disasters. Um, and so with, with, uh, with ever more like high stake deployments that we're seeing with, uh, with um, crashes and legislations that that's sort of driving uh, policymaking, you have these incredible incentives to either secure or circumvent these EDR devices. And so the directive that we took is, you know, how can we verify the integrity, authenticity, and completeness of these robotic logs under the threat of malicious or erroneous insertions and emissions? And so our approach for that was um, with the black block reporter, uh, essentially reusing um, the uh, secure ROS uh, um, setup to then enclave a particular recorder. 
And so you might have limited resources, particularly on what kind you what you can and cannot enclave in the subsystem, um, as well as uh, say like cost of material build of materials. If you were to like implement say write only once drive a worm drive, those are particularly costly as compared to maybe your consumer grade SSD or whatnot. Uh, so we we can consider that um, uh, that we'll. For various uh, requirements, such as uh, data retention policies or uh, user privacy, that we'll have to re uh, retain the logs on the platform itself, but we also need to ensure that these logs are, remain immutable. Uh, and so our approach is uh, to use uh, hash chains to develop uh, integrity proofs, and those integrity proofs can then be disseminated into a distributed ledger. Uh, say so that they can be reviewed and collected later for for use for by auditors or uh, digital forensics. Uh, but that gets you integrity. Uh, how do you ensure the authenticity of these of these uh, checkpoints? And so, in in a, in a conventional uh, robotics uh, deployment, uh, you might have an assortment of mutually distrusting parties. So um, you might have your uh, the custodian, the robot, the OEM manufacturer the, of the platform. Uh, you might have then the uh, identity that is entrusted to observe and record and monitor these uh, these devices. Uh, then you might have the owner, which is sort of the the owner of the data that is being recorded, either in their warehouse or on their taxi drive. Um, and then you might have the auditors of regulatory agencies that are uh, reviewing and inspecting and holding everyone accountable. And so what we developed here is a means of, of uh, formalizing this uh, configuration using smart contracts such that you can control the, the access of who has the ability to write uh, integrity proofs and transactions uh, into the ledger and how that might be void and how you can revoke that and all that stuff. Um, so coming back to my thesis statement, um, so we, we talked about um, the the necessity to uh, configure, verify, and monitor the security information flow control. And so I just want to emphasize uh, the particular contributions that we've done so far that tackle each of these uh, particular uh, case areas. So we talked about SROS and the penetration testing tool, as well as my work on procedurally provisioned access control, key mint, and com armor, um, and also to how to verify these setups um, using uh, network reconnaissance and formal logic. Um, and then how to monitor these systems. So the monitoring might be useful if you're um, trying to deliberate, um, and say in a security sense, of you're recording the uh, runtime measurements and you wanna make sure that those are retained, those remain intact when you go to use those in your policy decision-making. So you don't wanna have an attacker slipstream a particular permission by falsifying log information. So um, I'll actually touch about the, the last areas of my contributions. So uh, security considerations. So um, these, are, these are where I, I try and look back and review um, all, the case, the, all the special uh, aspects in robotics middleware, uh, particularly like the ROS uh, fundamental interfaces that you would choose to use when implementing your application. Uh, when you go to uh, do subsystem integration, you're composing multiple capabilities uh, with each other. Um, what strategies um, do you have to consider? Uh, as well as the case for um, multi-robot applications. So we're, when you're scaling up uh, a particular system to uh, say a swarm to, to, ha to handle more advanced workloads or um, uh, industry requirements. Uh, and, and to kind of ground this, we take a look at uh, sort of three uh, classic use cases in robotics. One of the most popular uh, frameworks. Uh, we have the case of, say, robotic arm, uh, is six off freedom. You're doing, say, uh, uh, manipulation and manufacturing assembly tasks or teleoperation. Uh, so what you see here is sort of the visualization of the, the arm and the uh, collision workspace. Um, down here below, you see the computation graph um, for all the various nodes and topics that are being exchanged for this uh, simple application. Um, we also took a look at uh, the mobile robot use case. So you have your 2D indoor ground-based robot with navigation, SLAM, localization. Um, and this framework is um, fairly more generalized. You know, it's, it's, it's applicable to a wide swath of 
of different types of robots and modalities of locomotion, uh, as well as uh, localization. And so it's, it's, it's fairly larger, more complex, um, but it is uh, very flexible. Uh, and let's take the case of the autonomous vehicle. So this is uh, with AutoWare Auto, uh, the ROS2 implementation of AutoWare. Um, and this particular demo is for autonomous valet parking or curbside pickup. Um, and so this is a, a fairly uh, more sequential and decomposed uh, example um, that in the sense that every module in particular AutoWare might be intended to, to be uh, deployed on a particular ECU within the vehicle. Uh, if we take a look at like maybe some statistics and characteristics of each device, uh, we can see um, all the various, uh, how many number of host processes or how many node a particular example composes, uh, how many interfaces uh, each example is using in ROS and what that in, uh, translates to as in terms of like a network uh, footprint in DDS. Um, and uh, Let's take a look at like a node composition here. It's like uh, both uh, the navigation and the uh, robot arm examples use a high degree of composition. They have multiple nodes per single process. Or it's not the case for the AutoWare. Um, in the case of uh, node coupling, so how interconnected uh, particular nodes are um, in, in terms of uh, topic exchanges, um, as well as uh, topic cohesion. So are there uh, temporal loops or is it a very sequential data flow in examples? And so here AutoWare is fairly sequential uh, as well as a network footprint. So uh, navigation is probably the largest uh, example with how many nodes and modules and capabilities it's affording. Um, but uh, it, uh, the other two translate to fairly smaller uh, number of, of processes and, and uh, footprints. But, uh, let's take a let's take a look now at security, both in say the middleware level and the application level. So at the middleware level, there's there's particular uh, concern considerations you want to take into account when uh, using certain uh, ROS uh, uh, interfaces. Let's, let's look at the service uh, in implementation. So you might have many clients connected to one server over a particular uh, service topic. Uh, what the abstraction translates to in the DDS implementation is you'll get two DDS topics, one for transmitting and receiving requests and one for transmitting and receiving replies. Uh, and one thing to just kind of be aware here is that uh, that you might not see from the abstraction is that you have this inherent observabil observabil uh, observability uh, across various clients in particular service so that every client uh, that is connected to a service can subsequently observe the reply message uh, for a particular client's request. Uh, however, there are various uh, alternate uh, implementations of, of, of how that might be translated. So particular vendors may choose to implement a service using a single DDS uh, service primitive topic. Uh, and there, what you want to consider is now that uh, you might be providing full duplex communication between your clients which is maybe something you didn't intend that, that you offer a covert channel for clients to communicate with each other, um, uh, agnostic of, of whatever the server is doing. Um, if we take a look at the uh, security considerations for the application, uh, let's take a look at the, the ROS patterns. Um, so we talked about sequential and temporal. Um, in ROS, we have these patterns for uh, eliminating uh, timekeeping, uh, publishing a clock signal to advance uh, and time synchronize all our measurements, uh, as well as a logging framework to aggregate uh, all the diagnostics and telemetry from all their nodes within the system. Um, but these two, two examples are, are fairly um, uh, in, uh, fairly nice in that uh, they're, they're straightforward and sequential. You might only have one source of time, your GNS sensor or your simulation environment, and you might have a limited number of authorized uh, log aggregation tools, your developer uh, tooling infrastructure. Um, similarly, for, for uh, topological flows, uh, you have cases where you have your lifecycle nodes. And so this is how you maybe uh, deterministically bring up your subsystem and that you, know, you want to make sure that your perception pipeline is only advanced uh, in publishing objects after the sensor driver has been initialized. And so that's, that's done through the exchange of uh, various uh, topics and services, uh, but it, it, it's a it's a uh, topological flow here. Um, 
Let's take, let's take the case of uh, transforms. So transforms are particularly egregious. Um, and it is a, it's a very common pattern in robotics uh, to provide a sort of a representation of transforms via links um, between the two. And these links are published asynchronously by various modules. So if you wanted to know the global pose of your robot, um, you would be, uh, that would come from the slamming pipeline, the slam pipeline providing the transform between the static uh, map reference frame to your uh, robot's footprint and its base link. Similarly, if you were uh, wanted to consider the calibration, the uh, extrinsics between the uh, camera frame, the optical camera frame that's going to come from your perception module, or if you're doing anything with your manipulation or gripper and you're doing the inverse kinematics of where the placement of your gripper, it's going to come from um, your arm uh, module. Uh, and these are all, these um, t transforms are published uh, via a global uh, monolithic TF topic. Um, and what, what may be problematic here is, uh, let's take the case of uh, for common robotics tasks, such as uh, transform lookups. So if you're doing anything with like hand-eye coordination or obstacle avoidance in your navigation or your global path planning, you're going to have to traverse uh, the, the TF tree to compute the, um, the relative transforms. And re what you're going to be crossing is um, uh, sources of information that come from various different modules in, in, in your computation graph. And so this can... Uh, adversely affect on uh, what degree that you could uh, ensure uh, information flow control in your subsystem if if everything is somewhat interdependent on everything else. Uh, if we take a look at um, uh, say AutoWare again, um, so using the aforementioned tools I, I presented, you know we can so we can start reasoning and consider about the security of these distributed robotic systems. Um, and identify, you know, architectural vulnerabilities um, for the, the robotic software development lifecycle. So particular issues that, that you may want to consider earlier in your development so you don't become too committed to any particular uh, implementation. Um, and so, like I said, you know, TF, it, for this particular example, is sort of a, is a um, spider web and that's connecting to everything else. And so even if, if you have some optical case, which uh, has, um, this uh, low coupling and um, uh, this sequential flow, you, you'll still kind of be thwarted by um, these design patterns of, of using TFs that interrupt uh, what you're trying to achieve. Um, and so coming back to uh, my thesis statement, I, I just wanna uh, iterate um, something that uh, I've, 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 I've been uh, considering. So the, the concepts such as uh, principle least privilege and uh, Privilege separation and separation of concerns, uh, like th these don't, they don't only not only apply to security, but can be equally applicable to other domains such as uh, reliability and safety engineering, since these, uh, the viability and stability of the overall system remains crucial uh, for any, in any case. So a benefit in considering the security, however, is that it provides an added mindset with which to express these uh, system properties and requirements that may not that may be universally shared among other domains in engineering, but are not easily audible or verified. Uh, thus, the, the means with which uh, these security properties and guarantees uh, may be uh, more accessible to roboticists uh, not only serves to protect roboticists from malicious actors and exploits, um, but also bolster the robustness of these distributed robotic systems in general, um, such as preventing accidental access of unintended interfaces with ever larger and growing robotic infrastructures. So the, the development and provision of usable tooling to enable and validate security includes motivations that are beyond mimply, uh, merely uh, simplifying cybersecurity, um, but will be key for the broader adoption and best practice of a across a range of robotic applications and software development. So uh, I'll just uh, touch on my conclusion here. So some of the observations I've also had uh, over the course of advocating robotics, uh, uh, security and robotics, is sort of like the devils in the details. Um, you can't foresee all the issues um, when you know when implementing security, you, you'll 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 find these uh, as you as you come across them. Um, but 
one thing you, you want to try and do is uh, try to influence the core level uh, of the design architecture. So th th there have been issues that we, we uncovered, such as um, how DDS mapping was done or how composable nodes were, were done. Um, and so discovering and repealing these architecture flaws or, or guiding the future development uh, to be more amenable to security um, was, was an important part of, of, of this work. Um, another aspect is sort of a, a build it and you will come. You might have like this chicken and egg problem where um, no one's adopting the infrastructure because it doesn't have security and no one's implementing security because no one's like adopting the infrastructure. So um, you sort of, to prioritize the security development uh, within these uh, development communities, it, it necessitates like mainlining these security features and to be able to get to the stage where you're going to mainline uh, a, a, these security features uh, in the main branches, yeah, they have to be accessible um, and usable. De developers aren't going to accept your PRs if, if the tools um, aren't readily uh, applicable to the end users um, and roboticists that are, that are um, incorporating these software middlewares. Um, so, so future work. Um, one thing I, 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 I'm going uh, I'm doing is um, I'm working on a startup to to commoditize these uh, the latter two the verification and monitoring to infrastructures and tools, um, and so uh, to kind of mature this technology so that it's it's really adoptable by industry um, and deploy like this these research into production. Um, uh, some more far out uh, aspects I am see is like uh, end to end verification. So where you're not only considering uh, the information flow on the middleware uh, top, uh, topology level, but also through the code. And so if, if you were able to jointly model uh, IFC uh, for both the um, communication graph and the uh, control flow within the program, uh, that would be advantageous for having a more accurate and uh, resonant model of, of your of your security. Uh, and then lastly, uh, to, to further the security economic ergonomics. So um, tooling is not always enough. Um, it sort of takes a village uh, to, to get somewhere. So um, to, to foster ex, uh, uh, this uh, security, you, you have to sort of get everyone to adopt it. Um, in particular, the case that maybe you're, 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 you're an end user and you're relying on a large exotic uh, project such as NAV2 or MoveIt or Autoware, um, and you don't want to have to be intimately familiar uh, with these subsystems to then try and apply security. It'd be nice if the maintainers themselves were able to define you know, your security requirements or your configurations uh, to enable uh, security for your local application. Uh, so this dives into, um, say, uh, the interface definition language, which is something that we already have in, uh, in ROS. And that's basically defines how we serialize uh, common uh, message uh, types. So if you have a particular topic, you know, what, how do you encode a GPS message? How do you encode an IMU message? Uh, and that helps foster interoperability between uh, subsystems that might be written in various different languages or architectures. Uh, similarly, I like to work on um, the a node definition language, which is uh, something that we're we're cooking up with the security working group that I helped found uh, to define sort of a manifest, a higher level manifest of of how nodes interface with each other. So, um, if if maintainers were able to provide and distribute these manifests along with their projects, when you go and incorporate into your own, uh, you do the subsystem integration. Um, you can pull in uh, all this uh, design time uh, static information um, that's helpful for, um, say, linting, like you're, uh, you're authoring a launch file or, or coordinating the orchestration startup routine of all your subsystems. It'd be nice if the util utilities were able to uh, highlight and identify uh, particular errors during, uh, that you would encounter at runtime. Like you, you wrote this node that subscribes this topic elsewhere in your subsystem. Uh, you define the same topic, but of a different IDL interface. Um, similarly, this would be a beneficial for security and that uh, we wouldn't have to necessarily resort to runtime measurements to collect the minimal spanning policy of the systems we wish to secure and deploy. We could do, use purely static analysis on how the, how the user is configuring and renaming uh, all their various topics uh, at design time and generate that uh, beforehand. So um, 
here are my references that I referred to uh, throughout the presentation. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to um, say my some acknowledgments. So uh, to all the mentors and colleagues with whom I've collaborated, facilitating contributions together, grander than one could achieve merely individually. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd really like to thank all my collaborators that uh, I've worked with over the years. With that, I'll take any questions if you guys have any. Great work. Okay, I have well, a question, by the way, if I may. Hmm. Um, it seems that your focus is primarily on security within ROS. So my question is, how do you see that interfacing with any extensions that you would need to put on hardware to deal with hardware security problems? Uh, hardware. Um, so one of the deals um, that we had uh, with the uh, um, like, like I said, when that node composition, let me flip to my backup slide. All right. So uh, I think earlier in my proposal, I talked about some of the issues that we had with uh, node composition. And composition is, is something that uh, developers will kind of resort to when they need um, more performance. So they'll, they'll compose multiple nodes into a single process so they can benefit from like, you know, these, these shared memory transports and inter-memory uh, communication. Um, and so maybe Lee, you can you could treat this uh, sort of as an abstraction of, of your hardware. So if you have sensor peripherals or uh, let's say your autonomous car, you have uh, an assortment of ICUs within the vehicle. If the nodes are are hosted on the same device, um, you would want to subsequently model that as like a as a single unit, a single context. Because if the device gets compromised, well then maybe essentially all the nodes on that device get compromised. Uh, and so this is uh, something we, we tried to work on in um, sort of reaching a compromise between both the, the core ROS2 uh, developers and uh, us as the security working group on um, how, how we can define uh, and retain this, uh, uh, how can we afford uh, verification and these kind of assortments. So I, I worked uh, pretty extensively on uh, defining and extending the currently po the policy composition to afford these kind of abstractions. So, in a sense, that I think if you were uh, to consider, say, security on on a component level of a hardware, um, this abstraction would be applicable in uh, reusing the same kind of contributions I I, I provided. Just to to follow up on a version of of Tiana's question. Um, both when you were talking about IFC and when you were talking about the EDRs, you referred to security enclaves. And um, of late, uh, microprocessor vendors have been offering hardware support to have enclaves that are logically isolated from the rest of the processor, where you can take some computation and cut it off so that you don't have to worry about access to its memory or view into its computational state. Is there a model for taking advantage of those kinds of hardware features and incorporating them into the security model or that are they at odds with the model you've defined? So you're saying you, you maybe have a, a, a single um, embedded like Intel system. Intel SGX or ARM yeah. Trust Zone, like can you take advantage of that or no, not really? Because this, this is at a different level and there's no real way to interface between the the kinds of guarantees they're trying to provide. Um, so the 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 resolution that you know we, we were um, modeling the information flow control is, is is purely on on the computation graph um, or or through the middleware. Um, so if the enclave and the external uh, semi-trusted or untrusted processes were communicating uh, over um, say SROS or, or secure DDS. Uh, we could still model that, but whether you'd want to choose to like, you know, entrust that the enclave, the integrity of the enclave is, is held. Like, you know, we've, we've seen lots of cases where people are maybe able to cir circumvent uh, things like uh, uh, SGX. Um, but the, at least the work that we did with uh, the black box recorder um, is um, to try and we, we kind of assume that at least these, these enclave frameworks would be, would be a viable use case because uh, uh, if you were to use other consensus protocols in your DLT like proof of work, it's not kind of a it's kind of a non-starter for robotics because 
we're dealing with like limited computing resources and battery power. We can't just have every device um, rely on uh, on finding hashes. But uh, what we could do is if we could do uh, rely lean on the enclaves to provide like proof of elapsed time. Um, that's something more efficient that at least ro robotics could, uh, could use. Um, yeah, did that answer your question? Um, I I think so. It sounds like. I will rephrase and you can tell me if I'm wrong, that there is a clear way to incorporate it in EDRs and it is less clear if there's as much of an advantage for IFC. Yeah, so, so, so if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're able to uh, connect the enclaves um, through the middleware and such that you can, you can incorporate them into the, uh, uh, the policy definitions, we can try and model that. Um, but uh, if you, if you it's going to be as accurate as as much as you trust the the, the fidelity of the system. So if the if the enclave can be compromised, then that might not be captured in your in your policy um, verification. So th this is kind of I guess a question that everybody asks and gets. But how do you know you got the policies right? Especially in this case, it seems like this thing is pretty complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, that that's one of the things that kind of motivated um, the procedurally generation. So, ba -ba -ba. let me scroll back to that. So procedural access control, uh, and it, with it, like this this modest case of like, all right, let's take uh, what we had in S ROS one, where we define permissions uh, in terms of ROS abstractions, topics, services, actions, parameters, and let's translate that into whatever is needed for the DDS middleware. It turns out there's a lot of like ways that that can go wrong, um, and particularly uh, um, when we identify these discrepancies both in the implementation and the and the abstraction. Um, uh, what we kind of identified is uh, there, there's two things. Um, say like uh, when the ROS2 designers were kind of picking like how do we map ROS2 topics to DDS topics? We have this namespace, this URI. Um, and, and because of limitations in DDS, that has to be a fixed length. And the ROS developers are like, eh, we don't want to have to have our fixed length topics because that might limit how many topics we can have or how long our namespaces can be. Uh, let's break up the topic, both uh, from a ROS topic to a raw DDS topic and a DDS partition. And it's this kind of weird thing where DDS has these orthogonal ways of, of labeling uh, data on the, on, the, on the data bus. Uh, and this dual use of topics and permissions resulted in permission aliasing, where if you were trying to secure permissions on the root level namespace, this is kind of specific, but it would allow for um, uh, people who are granted permission to uh, access uh, a particular topic of one string to access the topic of another because they had a matching partition uh, rule. And that's not something that's, that's very obvious. So uh, to try and tease out all these kind of corner cases, we, that's what we did with like this, uh, this sort of brute force uh, method of combinatorics of trying all the various ways uh, you could try and subvert the policy by uh, connecting to particular topics with various identities and discovering where the policy was, was held intact and where it deviated. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot of complexities in terms of going from ROS to DDS. And that's not something I think that your average roboticist um, is going to be able to account for. And so having tooling to, to get that, uh, to make that obvious and to, to, to raise awareness of, of particular issues, I think is uh, critical. So the, often related to that, it's always, in theory, that looks really nice. In practice, you know, the Black Hat teams finds ways of getting under the cover and get in and sort of, uh, you know, mess with your security. So in some sense, how do you guarantee that your system is safe enough that you're not having people sort of mess with it anyway? Because that's what we see, you know, people go in and say, you know, I found out that if I have spike to this buffer, you're host. So, so you not only now have to do, so, so you provided a, Tool work for making it simple to use security tools, 
But what have you also done to make sure that your tools are safe so that I don't go in and actually mess with the tools? The, the, the tools are safe, like the, describing ways that you can shoot yourself in the foot or? Um... Oh, I'm, I'm a devious person, <laughs> you know, so I, I would go in and, and change the, the code of your procedural access control code so that I can generate systems that are inherently insecure. So, you know, the next time I drive next to a car on the highway, I can hack my way in because I have a back door. So, so yeah, the question is, you're not only, you're, you're making it easy, but how do you also make sure that I don't build back doors into my tool suite? So, so one of the things I, I kind of mentioned in the considerations is uh, it's fairly straightforward to discover when you have a missing policy because then your just application doesn't work or you get an error saying like, there's no crash because it couldn't get access to this DDS permission. But if you have a case where you have an excessive permission that you're not necessarily utilizing, that's kind of a harder thing to, to detect. So like one of the earlier motivations and say the black box uh, recorder is that um, uh, we know in ROS2, we no longer have a ROS1 master as, a, as an Oracle to just ask, hey, what are all the interfaces being used and who's using them? Uh, so to, to take that runtime measurement. So the, the, the kind of nice thing we're, we're, think, we're trying to apply black box recorder to is uh, we have all the particular participants uh, record their own telemetry. And then maybe we run this uh, application and sort of a, a, a air gap system where then we can use this, we can reliably use this measurement uh, to infer. But the case is, let's say in the, in the transit of you're taking the subsystem out, outside of this air gap system to, to monitor it and someone intermittently uh, edits or mutates the log telemetry data to add excessive rules um, you without you know being able to verify the integrity and authenticity of these logs, uh, that policy could that, that rule could slip in, and then someone has like a covert permission that they could they could use. Um, I had another line of thought. Um, this escapes me. Let, let me ask a, a follow up question. Does does Ross either as it as it is used today or through your work? Um, have a notion of a uh, trusted boot and validated root of trust for the set of code and configurations that is loaded because all of the tools that you've talked about are runtime validation. If, if as Henrik suggests, one of those was compromised before start, then you'd be in trouble. And the way we deal with this in like, um, more static systems like your phone is that we will have a trusted boot process with a hardware key that will then verify the integrity of the bootloader, which will verify the integrity of the components. Yeah. It seems a little bit trickier here because you have so much late binding and, and dynamic policy. And so I'm curious, is that something that's been thought through how you're sure that the robot that you just turned on is in fact the robot you think it is? So yeah, that, that, that was my second line of thought that um, if, if you, if, if like an attacker is able to, uh, modify the, the, the library is feel like a DL overload or something, or, um, so the, in, in particularly in security DS, there's security plugins and they're hot swappable. So you can imagine someone writing a custom security plugin that is, uh, uh, of lesser, uh, uh, lesser security or it, it, it ignores policy rules or something like that. So it just, it, um, if, you were, if you were able to deploy that onto the robot, you could subvert um, the onboard uh, access control. Another thing is like maybe if you compromise the certificates. So um, this is all using classic PKI infrastructure, at least for the default security plugins. So if you were able to compromise the certificate authority that signed all the identity and permission tokens within the network, um, you could uh, write your own uh, credentials to join the network. Um, and then uh, the lastly, um, yeah, so, so it, at least for a lot of the uh, tools with like SROS, um, you know, we're, we're, we're using the official build farm. And so these are signed Debian packages. And so we have this uh, sort of open source method of, of, in, of uh, of tracking the the integrity and development and building of these of these uh, packages, but um, um, you may have the use case of like let's say if, if you're design time and you're 
incorporating um, someone else's subsystem like move it and someone was able to sit, um, submit like a malicious PR to modify uh, the manifest file, like, like I talked about with the node IDL, um, that'd be another way to maybe uh, trick people into um, uh, misconfiguring their security setup. So I have a maybe related question, um, less about like supply chain attacks, but more like you're, I guess, interposing on all kinds of different messages going across and you're parsing like what looks like x509 type things or xml um those things kind of typically have bugs right like like xml parsers are gross yeah you can, um, you can have a bomb yes and one yeah so so like what like are you somehow trying to minimize the tcb of your own reference monitor or is it just for now kind of like look that's a separate problem uh yeah, so so I think typically the 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 the, the, the developer workflow is like um, you would focus on on authoring and then generating your key material and sort of a sanitized environment where you trust the the root certificate authority to to be located and then uh, you need yeah, later to I'm, just deploy that. I, I, but you, you're, 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 you're you're talking I'm about the case of like there. runtime where like. Uh, these DDS security plugin is exchanging these XML tokens and someone could just put a bomb XML bomb in these tokens and then maybe trip them up. I think one thing is that uh, a lot of these vendors, they don't implement the full XML spec uh, for deparsing these tokens. So um, now, what do you, I, I'm asking what, what you're doing. But what I'm doing. Right. So I, I some note is compromised. Like, I, I don't know, like you can imagine whatever, like I, I got into your car and I attached a thing to whatever bus and I'm sending a message, mm. right? Presumably, like, I can't tell if that's like an allowed thing or not allowed thing, but like, let's pretend that it's an allowed thing or because you can just do it by compromising something else. I send a message on one of these PubSub mm. channels and I'm saying like, this message will have a bomb. So like, like what, like, is there anything that you are doing right now to get the reference monitor to like not get popped? So, and so it's like, okay if the answer is in, in, no, but intrusion detection? Uh, no, no. So well, it, it, I guess it, there's there, there's currently another uh, uh, robotics security startup uh, specifically focusing on on intrusion detection and and vulnerability to disclosure, uh, and well, I felt like I didn't want to uh, try and compete with that, so I let them have that field. It's not an intrusion detection, right? Like you're 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 looking at these messages, right? And you're doing something about these messages. You're saying yes or no, right? Or like you're, you're saying like like returning signed things if if, so, if you were able to compromise a component and you had the the credentials it'd be kind of hard to detect whether the element's been compromised and the only kind of mitigation you could do is maybe use certificate revocation lists uh if you did discover it to kind of um remove that identity that participant from the graph um but as long as like the, they're 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 using the same IDL interfaces to transmit, you know, their malicious TFs or their point clouds, it it'd be kind of hard to to discern, you know, whether something is abnormal other than looking at the, the data directly. But Rafael, I'm I'm I, I think the question is more so so the security at multiple levels. So mm -hmm. so if you think about it, if you show up with a process and it has you know, right now you have sort of key credentials, but in some sense you're verifying, do you have the right keys to enter the kingdom? But beyond this, you don't have what I would call semantic tools that actually looks at, are these messages the right kind of messages or is this a devious message? Uh, you know, if somebody shows up on my bank account and tried to withdraw a million dollars, somebody should say, you know, this is not okay uh, from a semantic point of view, but they might still have the login credentials. So, so I think what, what Dion is asking here is you are purely doing sort of key credential verification. You're not trying to understand is there a devious sort of message in what actually is being attained once you've entered the kingdom. I, I, I think I think uh, I go in this in a little bit in my um, my considerations or my conclusions about some of the the the, the uh, deficiencies and 
Um, there's certainly a lot of like middleware uh, security, but in terms of application security, in terms of, of ROS2, um, it's, it's somewhat lacking. Like one of the ideas I had in SROS1 is I wanted to protect individual parameters. So you could have read and write access to a particular parameter in a node. You didn't have to give all the parameters. So like, like you, you have a camera driver and maybe you only want to expose the ISO control, but not the focus. You could, you could, you could do that in, in, um, in SROS1. But SROS2, it's, it's a lot more granular and just like an entire DDS topic. And uh, the way that parameters, I, I skipped the slide for time, the way the parameters are kind of implemented is uh, through the use of uh, uh, several um, services. And so the case of like maybe Stefan's example, where like you, you were able to compromise one particular node and you tried using the permissions that you gained to do other miscellaneous things that are allowed by your policy, um, I think we could do a better job in, in trying to lock that down even further. Uh, one of my suggestions is maybe through the use of uh, DDS keys, and that's where you can label a particular sample of the data. So it's not just the topic or the, the bus, it's like the particular sample that goes across the bus. And so if you were able to control that, you know, it's like uh, suddenly uh, Stefan's compromised node tries to publish TFs that are from the gripper, because he compromised the gripper because that's what it touched or something. Uh, he tries to publish TFs that uh, uh, either publish extraneous transforms between the static reference frame and the, the robot's footprint to like throw off the navigation or to replay attack uh, old transforms that are expired just to like DDoS the system. Um, if, if we're able to uh, resolve the security at the level of, of the data sample keys, that might be a way to mitigate saying like, this gripper shouldn't be publishing TFs that are from map to base link. I'm going to ignore that. Or maybe I'll just uh, disconnect from that participant entirely because that way I could identify that um, this is an erroneous or uh, compromised node. Questions in public from the committee or from the audience before we. Uh, uh, to close for a, a, a private session. Don't be afraid. I'm, I'm hearing noise, but I'm not hearing a uh, voice. Okay. Then we will say thank you to, to this. Thank you, Ruffin. Uh, and then um, we will turn it over. So unless you are UCSD faculty, we are saying thank you for coming and uh, we will announce uh, the verdict afterwards, but uh, ask you to log off. Uh, I don't 